Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College. And today we're going to talk about celiac disease and what it means to eat gluten-free. Something we hear more about these days. My guest today is Stephanie Schiff, a registered dietitian in the Food and Nutrition Services Department of Huntington Hospital, a member of Northwell Health. Stephanie, welcome to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's good to have you. So tell me a little bit about you. What made you decide to become a registered dietitian? Well, this is actually my second career. Uh, when I graduated college, Brooklyn College, um, I wanted to go into the health field, and I wanted to make a little bit of money for graduate school. But um, So I went into the city to get a job, and I found myself on Wall Street. And I actually stayed on Wall Street for about 10 years. I've always been interested in nutrition. Um, after that, I went home. Actually, I was married. I raised a family. And when my kids went back to high school, or within, when they were in high school, um, I decided to go after my real passion, which was nutrition. And, at, and I went back to high school part-time while the kids were in school. I got my second degree in nutrition. I did an internship uh, for nutrition, and I became a dietitian. And I immediately went into Huntington Hospital on Long Island, where I've been for the last nine years. And I finally feel like I am home in this field. That's a great story. So tell me, we're here to talk about celiac disease. What is it? Well, celiac disease is a disease that's autoimmune, and it's hereditary as well. Uh, When a person has celiac disease and they eat something containing gluten, which is a protein found uh, in wheat, rye, and barley, their body launches an attack on it because it considers the gluten a foreign object, a foreign uh, molecule. Uh, When the gluten reaches the small intestine, the body starts to attack itself. That's why it's an autoimmune disease. And what happens is, within the small intestine, there are these finger-like projections called villi, uh, and they are there to absorb the nutrients from the food that we eat. But when you have an attack on the gluten, you're also having an attack on the small intestine in the villi. They then become flattened out and damaged, and they can no longer absorb the nutrients from the foods that we're eating. So they don't absorb the protein, the fat, the calories, the vitamins and minerals. Uh, And that leads to some very uh, uncomfortable symptoms, such as diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting, pain. Those are the short-term symptoms, but longer-term, it does even more damage where it can cause, uh, because you're not absorbing these nutrients, uh, you can get anemia, um, malnutrition, uh, damage to your tooth enamel, damage to your bones. It affects the brain. It affects just about every single part of the body. So initially... There are physical um, symptoms that are very, just really very uncomfortable, and unfortunately, there are symptoms nobody wants to talk about because gastrointestinal sy- symptoms aren't a pretty thing to talk about, yeah. so people hide it. Yeah. But longer term, if it's not controlled, it's really going to cause some damage. So is celiac disease becoming more prevalent? I didn't hear of celiac disease as much as I'm hearing of it today. Is it becoming more prevalent? It's a little bit hard to say. Certainly, we're hearing more about it, but that could be due to a couple of things. Um, Number one, maybe people are getting it more. Maybe people are learning about it more and are self-diagnosing themselves. So they go to the doctor and the doctor can say um, yes or no, you have it or you don't have it. People talk about the different kinds of, so celiac disease, gluten. Uh, Gluten is a protein and it's found in wheat, rye, and barley. And those three grains, they're being grown a little bit differently right now in the United Mm. States. So we're using more pesticides. We're using more um, disease-resistant strains of wheat, Mm. rye, and barley. I even have people 
tell me that um, maybe not they have celiac disease, maybe gluten intolerance. They'll go to Europe and they say, oh, I'll, I eat all this bread in Europe and I feel fine. So it could be it could be the grain. It could be more self-reporting. Um, it could be our knowledge about celiac disease. It could be the Internet and social media where you have all these amazing support groups that say, hey, I have this. And you can read something and say, whoa, that describes me perfectly. Maybe this is what I have. You talk about the grains that we consume and how there is an intolerance for it. Does that have anything to do with the grains being manipulated in some way that they are here? Like they're some GMOs or, right, could that be it? And that could be part of it as well because most of our grains now, again, in the U.S. are GMO grains. Does that change the structure? Does that make the gluten more of a foreigner to the body? Again, that's that's that could be well part of it. So if I have these symptoms, rehearse the symptoms again. What are they? Wow. There are about 150 symptoms, but let's say some common ones are nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, gassiness. They're pretty typical of a lot of gastrointestinal issues. So if I was just to notice that I'm experiencing these things, these symptoms mimic a lot of different health issues. Like I'm thinking about irritable bowel syndrome. I'm thinking about maybe a gastroenteritis, you know, so many different types of, you know, I can self-diagnose. How is this tested? Okay, so you're absolutely right because this mimics, this can mimic day to day living for certain people. People get nervous and they have stomach issues. They feel, right. they feel nauseated. Even this anxiety, is, um, right? Anxiety is a big one. There's, right. yeah, there, there's a reason that people, you know, people get anxious or, or come to a radio station and feel a little bit sick in their stomach right, or whatever nervous. it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are common, very common symptoms. If you have these symptoms for more than two weeks, they might be worth looking okay. into. If these symptoms accompany another uh, set of symptoms called um, dermatitis herpetiformis, which is very common, uh, it's fairly common with uh, celiac disease, which is a skin rash where the skin blisters and is mm-hmm. itchy, and it occurs on the knees and the elbows and the back of the head, the face, the torso. That is something along that can go along with um, the other symptoms. If you have a first degree relative, a brother, a sister, a mother, a child who has celiac disease, it's a really good idea to get tested Mm -hmm. because it is a genetic disease. And if you have a first degree relative with celiac disease, you have a one in 10 risk of having celiac celiac disease um, yourself. So the family history, symptoms that last for two weeks or longer, a rash on your body, those all make it a little bit different make it a little bit special and a good reason for you to go to see a doctor. And the doctor will check through your lab tests and he will um, check through your family history and look at all Mm -hmm. your symptoms and then decide if you need or you should get a celiac test, a test for celiac. So what specific lab tests are we looking at with celiac disease? So we can do blood tests and the blood tests can test to see if you have antibodies Mm -hmm. for the gluten. Mm -hmm. Um, there are gene- there's genetic testing, and there are two genes: the HLA uh, DQ2, the HLA DQ8. Um, y- if you have celiac disease, you either have one or both of those genes. Just because you have the genes doesn't mean you have celiac. But if you have celiac, you have one or both of those genes. So they could test for that. But the gold standard for celiac testing is the biopsy. So the doctor can take a uh, endoscope. And it's a long tube, flexible tube, and it goes down your throat into the first part of your small intestine. It's got a little camera at the end Mm -hmm. and a little tool to cut tissue out of your small intestine. They can take a look at what your small intestine villi look like. If they're flattened or if they're up and waving their little fingers, that's great. If they're flattened and damaged. That's a sign. That's a huge sign. Uh, And they can take a little bit of tissue, look at them more closely. And that's pretty much the definitive test, that biopsy. Now, there's always a potential of having a false negative for the blood tests or for the um, the biopsy. But they're really they're very specific tests. And if you're going to go through that, even if if you have one, you're pretty it's pretty convincing that you do have celiac disease, um, except for the the um, the genes, because you don't have to have you don't have to um, if you have them, you don't have to have celiac disease. But the testing the villi is the biopsy is is the gold standard. It's what proves pretty much that you have it. That you really yeah. have it. So is there any way I know if you have it, uh, say if I'm a parent, is it a high chance of my child having it? And if so, can I prevent it in my child? There is a chance. There's a greater chance uh, if your child has it than if you don't have it. But it's a great way to 
find out if he has it early on because the earlier you catch it, the more you can take care of your body and the less likely you are to get symptoms later right. on. And if you don't catch celiac disease early on, the older you are, the more likely you're going to have other autoimmune diseases crop up. Mm. So you want to test your child and you know what? If they test negative, beautiful. Fine. If yeah. you're, Then it's great. Um, and if they test positive, you will know early on what to do and how to treat it and it will set them up for life and it's it's will have they'll be used to eating this way mm -hmm. and what to do and they'll have you as a role model to show them what to do. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard and today you are learning about celiac disease and what it means to eat gluten-free. My guest today is Stephanie Schiff a registered dietitian in the Food and Nutrition Service Department of Huntington Hospital, a member of Northwell Health. So, Stephanie, you talked uh, a lot about uh, celiac disease. What do I eat? Now that I know that I have it, what does my diet look like? Well, I'm not going to say it's easy because it takes a bit of work and it takes a bit of cooperation from people around you. Uh, you are going to stay away from anything that contains wheat, barley, and rye and triticale, which is a cross between wheat and rye. Um, so that means... Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. It is, because it's sort of like a lot of our favorite foods. Yeah. It, it's in breads and pastas and cakes mm. and cookies. It's in a lot of processed foods. Yes. Uh, so the first thing you're going to do is push aside those cakes, cookies, and breads and say, okay, I know I have to stay away from those uh, right off at the beginning. Now, let's let's just start a little bit with what you can eat, because... Uh, you can eat fruits, vegetables, meats, poultries, chicken, fish, beans, nuts, um, flour made from nuts, fl flour made from beans. So okay. there is a wide variety. Mm -hmm. The best way to eat is simply um, go to the pro produce section, the dairy section. The simpler the foods, you know that they're not going to have um, wheat, rye, or barley in them. Then it gets more complicated because we all eat things in a jar or a bag or a box and they have nutrition labels. So now you're going to need to read the nutrition labels yeah. and you're going to look for wheat, barley, rye. You're also going to really look carefully because there are so many foods that, um, that don't say wheat, right. but things like um, wheat berries, durum, semolina, spelt, farro, farina, those are all different names for wheat. So now you have to get used to that. You're not going to eat barley, but you also have to avoid foods that have malt in them. Mm -hmm. So that could be malt flavoring and, and some, um, some corn flakes and some... How about beer? Rice Krispies. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need to stay away from beer unless it's labeled gluten-free. They do make gluten-free beers, but yes, beer is made from malt. Right. So regular beer, no, you have to stay away from that. Um, you can, however, have distilled liquor. So okay. you can actually have rye liquor and vodka because the distillation process doesn't allow the gluten particles. They're gotcha. protein molecules, and they're too big to go through the distillation process. So even though these liquors may be made from grains, they don't carry the gluten molecule. So oh. there's good news about that. So between okay. the gluten-free beer um, and speaking of you know, gluten-free, there are products that are labeled gluten-free. Those are the easiest ones to go for. Yeah. And the FDA regulates that. And the FDA says, if you're going to uh, put gluten-free on your, because it's the companies that put the gluten-free label on them. And the FDA says, if you're going to put this, uh, label this as gluten-free, it has to have less than 20 parts per million of gluten, wow. which um, people tend to need over 50 parts per million to have a reaction. So under 20 should be fine for pretty much anyone, but look for those labels because they are there. If they're not there, then you're at the mercy of the company. You really need to know what you're eating. Now, if you're going to somebody's house, it gets yeah, hard. Yeah, picking restaurants. Okay, so the good thing is there are so many more restaurants that have gluten-free menus now. Yeah. They're being very accommodating, and this is where it gets hard for them and hard for you at home. If you have a family and they are not gluten-free, you cannot... One of, the, one of the ways you can um, react to gluten is not necessarily by eating wheat, rye, or barley, but by eating foods that are contaminated mm -hmm. with wheat, rye, mm -hmm. or barley. And that's actually really easy to contaminate. Um, now, take a food like oats. They're grown often next to wheat fields. Right. Oats don't have gluten in them, but they can be contaminated in the wheat field. Foods can be contaminated at any stage from where they grow 
to where they're served, processed. Do they have to have that uh, uh, disclaimer um, uh, manufactured in an area where gr- wheat is grown? Do they have to have a disclaimer on the label? They sometimes do. It's not required. Okay. The only thing that's required is if you're going to be, say, gluten-free, you have to be below 20 parts per million. It's really up to the company. So they can do that. And actually, I don't know how Bob's Mills, which is a great grain and uh, great grain producer, uh, they do an oatmeal that is gluten-free. And I believe they might put that on there and they and then they can put the gluten-free because they're under 20 parts per million okay. and Quaker Oats if you like oatmeal and I'm always pushing oatmeal for everybody oh yeah um, then Quaker Oats has gluten-free oats but they're specially packaged don't just get any mm-hmm. of their Quaker Oats because they have like you know the instant the one one minute they're the really steel quick cut, right the steel cut yeah. um, but you have to look for the gluten-free, otherwise you run the risk of being contaminated. And so the restaurants, what they have to do is they have to cook, if they're going to say they're gluten-free, they have to cook their food in separate dishes, separate. separate utensils, yes. separate everything. Similar to a nut allergy, uh, right? Similar, actually even worse. Okay. Because it's easy even for grains to float over mm. and land mm-hmm. on food. It's easier to be contaminated if you have a gluten-free allergy. Mm. So if you're going to a place and um, you're, you're ordering French fries, no problem, right? French fries have no gluten in them. But if they're using the fryer for chicken nuggets, then those little bits of crumbs from the chicken nuggets are going to contaminate the oil, yeah. which will contaminate the French fries. So it has to be so separate, different cutting boards, different everything. And if your restaurant, the one that you like, can't guarantee that you're, they're using separate utensils, a separate room, then I would stay away from that. Wow. So can I have a wheat intolerance and not have celiacs and vice versa? So You can, can have a gluten intolerance or a wheat allergy right. uh, and not have celiac disease. Right. And the difference between, say, a gluten intolerance right. to celiac disease is celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. So your body's going to attack itself and attack the small intestine, whereas a gluten intolerance yours your small intestine is going to remain intact and you won't have the genes for it either so you're going to have the same similar reactions but what your body is doing inside is not the same as if it had celiac disease that's way more serious for a wheat allergy you tend to have a more of an allergic reaction and there's some and there are actually some food products that contain wheat but the gluten has been stripped out of it so um that lessens your chances so because a lot of people there there was a whole trend about 15 years ago uh when i pretty much got into this business um and everybody was going yeah everybody was going gluten-free it was such a trend and there were stores popping up everywhere um and because people were told to believe that if you go if you're um if you go gluten-free even if you don't have celiac disease, even if you're not gluten intolerant and they're telling you what you probably are because you have these symptoms and didn't everybody, they said you would you could go um, gluten free and you would lose weight and you would feel great. Now, you don't see these gluten free. You see gluten free sections in health food stores. You, you don't, don't see these gluten free stores That's anymore right. because it wasn't true. Mm-hmm. And all these books. Oh, my gosh. There was a person on um, Survivor. Elizabeth Hasselbeck. Uh, the story about her was she um, she was on Survivor. She was in her 20s. It was one of the early ones. Uh, and she was always pretty sickly. Tiny little thing. She goes to the island and all of a sudden she feels great. Everybody else is starving. But she feels fantastic. She's got energy. She's doing so well. She almost, I don't know if she got to the finals. Maybe she did. She went home. She got sick again. Turns out she realized that she was on the island eating rice oh, and vegetables. Okay. No gluten. And she felt great. And then she came home and she ate her traditional diet. She did go on to write um, a book about being gluten free. It doesn't sell for very long. It's great if you have celiac, but it doesn't really make sense to do it if you are, if you don't have celiac disease. Now, if you really feel better, um, if you think you're gluten intolerant, whether you've been tested or not, if you stop eating gluten for a while and see how your body reacts. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think you have celiac disease, you might have celiac disease and you want to go get tested by a doctor, do not stop eating gluten. Mm-hmm. That would be a very bad idea because as soon as you stop, your intestines start to heal. Mm. And then when you go to the doctor, they say, oh, you're fine. I don't see anything. And then you go back to eating gluten. And then you're 
So, yeah, we don't have those stores anymore. Those poor people opened them up, got, got excited. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard. And today you're learning all about celiac disease and what it means to eat gluten-free. My guest today is Stephanie Schiff, a registered dietitian and in the Food and Nutrition Services Department at Huntington Hospital, a member of Northwell. So all of this is very interesting to me. Tell me, can celiac disease ever be cured? You mean within you or in a lifetime? In a lifetime or within you. Well, I mean, in a lifetime for the, for the general public. The good news is in our lifetime, there are treatments being worked on. There are medications that are being worked on to obliterate the gluten molecules. There are medications being worked on for our bodies to not have this severe reaction to the gluten. But in terms of if you have glu- uh, celiac disease, unfortunately, no. Once you have it, you have it. And there's only one cure, and that's to colim- completely eliminate gluten from your diet. So that's, that's the tough part. You, it, there is no cure. So what would you say to someone who's self-diagnosing themselves um, and they having all of this abdominal complaints, abdominal bloating and the symptoms? What would you say that they need to do first? Should they eliminate lactose from their diet? Should they go to the doctor? What kind of doctor do I go to? Uh, They can try. They can try, as you said, eliminating lactose because that's a very, lactose intolerance is very, very common. That's very common too. And again, becoming more and more common. What is it? Is it our milk? Is it our dairy products? Is it our cows? Uh, So that's tough to say, but, and a lot of people develop lactose intolerance out of nowhere. So sure, you can go to um, allergens and eliminate certain types of food to see if maybe it's something else. You can eliminate fructo oligosaccharides and do an elimination diet or whatever food you think might be affecting you. You can always eliminate it for a week or two and then bring it back in. Mm -hmm. But if after a while you don't feel well, if after a couple of weeks, there's no harm in going to either your primary doctor or a gastroenterologist Gastroenterologist. Okay, because they specialize in diseases of of the intest of the gastrointestinal system. So that would be a good idea. So is there a medication protocol for a patient with celiac disease? Are they placed on a medication or is it just dietary strictly? Usually there are medications that they're placed on, um, but usually it's the food. It's the food. Yeah. And you really have to take a deep dive into that because because of their, there are so many instances of um, cross-contamination you have to be very, very strict and you have to look at every place that that gluten might come in because people will think that they're gluten free and then they they're just not healing. And usually there's some place that they're they're missing as well. So where do I go if I have someone in my family or I'm preparing to have a visitor over that says they have celiac disease? Where do I go to get information of what to pre- what to cook, what to prepare? How do I you know, how do I entertain someone with celiac disease? If you have celiac disease, your best bet, really, unless you know or unless you are somebody who is really willing to take a deep dive and use separate, separate utensils, plastic utensils instead of um, instead of wood, separate dishes, then if you have celiac disease, probably your best bet is to bring your own food because you know exactly where it's Uh, coming from. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's hard, but at least you're getting to eat with people. It's social and you know you're protecting yourself. If you are willing to take that on for yourself and you know you have um, someone coming, you might want to even order the food from a place that provides Mm. gluten-free food. Good idea. Plastic forks, plastic knives, so that you know that between where they made the food and it has to be a place that's very well trusted, between that and your home, you can say, okay, this was prepared. You know, we prepared this for you. Don't worry about it. We checked it out. Mm -hmm. The utensils are fine. The food is fine. And we hope you enjoy it. So it all depends on you. So what if I have a child? The child goes to school. They have to go to school and eat. You know, um, are schools equipped to provide um, a gluten free diet for my child who, you know, who is there? I honestly that would be great to look into, and I'll, I, because I don't talk to too many people who are young enough, right? Or, but um, I do not know because we've worked with a lot of schools, but I don't know of any that do that. The peanut allergies are, yeah, know, it's that's a little very bit prevalent. Easier, yes. and you can either you can usually tell families, please, my child has anaphylactic shock. We can't have him near because 
I'm sure you know that even with um, peanut allergies, some people smell it. Yes. And have a violent reaction right. to it. So schools either have the peanut free tables or the peanut free areas. Um, it's it's much harder to do because it's easy it's easy to bring your own food if you're a child and if you have peanut free tables then you can deal with that. Celiac is going to be a little bit harder, so you will need to prepare food for your child. Probably pack their own pack their lunches own and be and really supportive yeah. for them. You know, do convince you know tr- talk to them and say, hey, this is just the way you eat. We're going to try to keep you healthy. You know, you're like all the other kids. You just can't really tolerate this and you don't feel that well when you eat this food. Right. So we're going to make some special food for you and make them. There's so many good foods that they will like. Probably there really will. are a lot of choices. But with the way schools are, um, it's tough because food just, and you know how kids are. They you do. know, they exchange food. Yeah. They touch your plate. They stick their fork in your food. And it's really hard <laughs> if you're a kid a and challenge. they're just being kids yeah. and friendly so you want to make it as easy for your child emotionally and physically as possible. So where can someone find out more information about you or Huntington Hospital and what they provide? There are so many um, sites online. You can go to uh, celiac.org. If you just if you punch in celiac um, disease, there are great sites. I would either go to a hospital, an educational system, or a .org system and because you know that the information there is great. You can Google Huntington Hospital. We have some amazing gastro. My, some of my favorite people at the hospital are our gastroenterologists. They're just really good natured people for whatever <laughs> reason. And I hope they're listening to this. You know who you are. Uh, <laughs> and your name is spelled S-C-H-I-F-F? That's correct. And Stephanie is S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E. So what is the one thing in one sum in a couple of words that you would leave with us when it comes down to celiac disease and gluten-free diet? Don't get down on yourself. It's going to be a little bit tough when you get used to it, but eat as simply as possible. For any disease, and this is an inflammatory disease, for any disease state, eat as simply as possible. Eat foods as close to the natural source as, as possible. Eat your fruits, your vegetables, your berries. Um, eat chicken, eat fish. These are all good, healthy foods that you're not going to react to. And not only is it going to keep your celiac disease at bay and and make it easier to have a healthy diet, uh, it's also going to help other issues. It's going to help with your gut microbiome. It's going to help with diabetes, with heart disease, because unfortunately, celiac disease is is an autoimmune disease, and it could lead to other diseases. But all these Diseases tend to be inflammatory diseases, so you want to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. Basic one, it's stay away as much as possible from the processed foods and from added sugars too, because they contribute to the inflammation within the body. Thank you for being here. Stephanie Schiff, a registered dietitian in the Food and Nutrition Service Department of Huntington Hospital, a member of Northwell Health. We hope you stay safe and continue to stay healthy, and thank you so much for sharing this important health information with us. Thank you. It's been great to be here. This is Dr. Janine cook Rod from the nursing department here at NASA Community College. And we want to thank you for listening to this week's edition of Your Family's Health. We'd like to get your feedback on Your Family's Health. Send your comments by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu. Podcasts of today's show are available on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. This program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.